Hey everybody, so today I am joined by a special guest and that is Roberto Navalli and he is somebody that I have known for years. He is so highly regarded in the NLP community and today we're going to have a little chat and we're going to talk about the future or at least some of the trends in multilingual NLP and he's going to show us two examples of projects that he's got going on. So if this is your cup of tea, make sure you stick around. Let's go get started. So Roberto, I've heard some interesting things in the news about you on LinkedIn. It sounds like you've got a lot of accolades. So tell us a little bit about that. What are some of those things that you're doing right now? Oh my, thanks a lot. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, well, so many things are going on. Uh, I think multilingual natural language processing is a field that is exploding now. And uh, we've seen a lot of um, developments uh, in the past few years and uh, really uh, it's going up exponentially. So that's why uh, my students at the Sapienza University of Rome and also a lot of people whom I know uh, are more and more excited about doing work in this direction. So, so many yeah. projects. Yeah, and I think that's a really positive step in the right direction for so long. I felt that a lot of people would say, well, you know, English or maybe Spanish or or French were like primary languages that a lot of people knew, just leave it at that. And, you know, that's just not, I think, appropriate anymore. We have such a global and diverse industry that we work in and, and society that we work in that making sure that people and their languages and dialects, which I know you know a lot about, um, is really important. So it's really good to hear you say that as well. So tell us a little bit about your work with the EU. I know that you were working with them on some things. What's that all about? Yeah, that's a great example of how important all languages are and not only the most uh, spoken ones. Um, it, it actually uh, happened for me, uh, it, came, it came as a surprise at some point that I was approached by EU representatives. And so at some point, they came up with the idea that we then developed that uh, we could uh, use our semantic technology to interpret trademark denominations. Mm -hmm. So when a company wants to uh, submit and register a uh, verbal uh, trademark, um, mm -hmm. they have their own rules to decide whether this is an appropriate trademark or not, whether it violates any of the rules, mm -hmm whether it's a suitable, whether it contains within the uh, maybe original word, something that communicates uh, something bad or, uh, or inappropriate. And mm -hmm. so because they have to do this in all EU official languages, and we have 24 uh, official languages, yeah. uh, <laughs> it was a big challenge. Yeah, and I love that use case. So often, you know, we hear these overall use cases for this kind of technology, you know, recommendation engines and being able to, you know, detect fraud and, you know, those kinds of things. What you're talking about is, you know, obviously in, in that legal realm, I think, is where it really belongs. Um, in many cases, it's also talking about trade and understanding you know, is this appropriate? And um, being able to to file for a trade patent, right? Like all that kind of stuff kind of follows along with what you're talking about. So it's so interesting to know that you're kind of behind the scenes of a lot of that work, which is pretty cool. So what are some of the other things that you're working on? I know you, so for the audience, Roberto is always cooking something up, always. <laughs> So if you ever want to know some crazy idea that, that is going to have legs really soon, to go talk to Roberto because he's always got something fun and exciting going on. So what are some of those exciting things that are going on for you, Roberto? Yeah, if I were a chef, you would not like to enter my kitchen. <laughs> 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 a, a word chef yeah yeah exactly oh that's well, fun so though. many things so many things i don't know um so on the uh, research side we are uh, working hardly on um creating multilingual and actually language independent representations uh, of the meaning not only of single words but also entire sentences and even text full text mm -hmm. like like an interlingual, like uh, something that you could use as a, a bridge between uh, uh, languages in a way that is independent of the languages. Industry-wise, there are so many applications that, uh, again, surprisingly, 
come from companies themselves. Yeah, I, I'm an, uh, I'm a researcher. So um, actually, for me, uh, all of these examples that come from companies are so exciting because it's the other side of the coin. Then you see how they can be truly used in real world uh, applications and use cases. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's the most exciting part. We have, for example, created a system to navigate, to browse um, information about AI in Italy, like mm -hmm. researchers, uh, universities, uh, topics, and see how they connect to each other and um, what's related to what and so on. We even created a, a knowledge graph of food that then oh, we can query by recipe or by ingredient or by um, uh, concept and then see what other things are related. But, well, it's, yeah. still, it's, it's still exciting though, because when you're looking at, I know that I haven't done much with recipes, but I have done things with poetry, things that um, are structured in a, in a weird way, or even um, when people are putting together um, protocols on how to do like medical, um, you know, chemistry and things like that being able to get a machine to actually read a recipe or a protocol or a, a, a poem and understand what's actually in there is a little tricky. So kudos to you for getting the machine to even understand some of that. But what are some of the things that are coming up outside of the things that you've mentioned? So one, one a very cool thing that uh, we are doing is to um, go beyond the current uh, uh, electronic lexicography. Mm. So lexicography uh, has been working for centuries on dictionaries. Uh, well, we all know paper dictionaries and we know some of these electronic dictionaries. But actually, there's a new type of dictionary of which probably Babelnet is an ancestor, um, which could actually uh, be um, uh, produced. Uh, and it's a new thing. And actually, I, I talked to the Academia della Crusca, which is a, the most prestigious uh, institution in Italy about language and uh, in the Italian language. Mm -hmm. um, and they were very excited about the potential creation of a new uh, wave of dictionaries mm -hmm. that would include electronic dictionaries, of course, that would include um, is many sentence examples mm -hmm. that could be multilingual by design that whose definitions actually would be um, not written for humans, but written mm -hmm. for both human and uh, computer consumption. And yeah. uh, in a sense, the definition would be a graph, a knowledge graph that then could be used to uh, output uh, multiple definitions in many languages. Mm -hmm. So this is a revolutionary. There's nothing like this. And this could be obviously applied also to any kind of knowledge graph. Yeah. Uh, so while starting from the Italian language, then we could move to more specific domain specific knowledge graphs yeah. or uh, multilingual domain uh, graphs and so on. There's another project that mm -hmm. uh, excites me a lot, um, which is um, a game for the EU. Uh, it's something that, I mean, it's not, it's just a demo that I would like to showcase. Yeah. I think, they, I think they will get excited. Yeah, so it's that's something great. that has to do with translators and interpreters. You know that the EU spends uh, billions of euros oh. in uh, translating and interpreting text into all the other languages uh, in the European Union. And um, so I'm preparing a demo for them to um, interpret multilingual uh, document bases and uh, uh, help the interpreter or the translator prepare for their task. Mm, mm -hmm. you know so it's an assistant to the translators. That's nice. Yeah. So it's, a, it's to assist them in the task. And you know that interpreters uh, often spend uh, weeks uh, mm -hmm. getting to the topic that they then have to interpret. I mean, that's one thing just to, to stop here and, and to highlight is there is so much that um, computational linguistics can, can get us and so much that we can offer up. But at the end of the day, just like you're going to hopefully show here, is with translations especially, it's all about that context and that understanding of that culture. And, and the you know when somebody says 
an idiom, for instance, in another language, it's going to mean something totally different. And if you're just translating word for word, you're not going to pick up on that. So there's still always that human element. I always like to highlight that because I have so many conversations about machine learning where people get a little upset and they're like, machines, you're just trying to replace everybody. And I'm like, machines are not very smart without people. They, they You still need a lot of people to do all of this. It's not magic. <laughs> I agree. So this is a demo that we prepared for um, to show our ability to browse uh, content uh, in, in the artificial intelligence domain. And here you can, uh, so we summarized our document base of papers and so on into an, an AI knowledge graph. And for example, you can query uh, the uh, knowledge graph uh, via a, the name of someone like uh, Roberto Navigli, for example, that's me. And then you will see uh, uh, related concepts, related areas, uh, researchers who are related to him and uh, universities. And then you oh, can nice. browse this content. You can view this in any other language because of course here you only have Italian and English, but it's just for demo purposes. So you yeah. can view the very same content in any language and then you can navigate it. Like for example, if you uh, click words and disambiguation, then you can further go further down the uh, graph you can see uh, related topics, add them to the graph, or add more people, or then restart from some other topic. Like, I don't know, I want to see who's who's uh, doing the best work at Sapienza. Um, I can see uh, the, those researchers who, are, who have the best uh, connection to the university and also the highest uh, bibliometrics. And then you can add more, more content. So you can really oh, cool. navigate through all this content. And yeah, this, this this reminds me a lot of um, connected papers. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, and then there's also, uh, what was it? Uh, Microsoft Academic, uh, which is apparently yeah. not a thing anymore. They both had something very similar to this, but I like your visuals better. For example, here you can see, you can start from the recipe and you can see what are the ingredients, uh, the other related recipe. With oh, I love dishes. that. Uh, for example, this is a related dish. And then you can see what is most connected to both, for example. Yeah. Or what's the next dish, dish you can cook with a yeah. certain set of ingredients. Oh, I, I love that. I love there that. there was for a long time no apps and, and no, um, there was nothing to help you if you had a certain ingredient set and you needed to find a recipe for it. There there are more out there now that do that. But one thing I, I, I want to um, express to the audience here is this is a really cool way to browse things. But something else that, that you could look at this with is if you had to explain to your stakeholders how recommendation engines work, this is sort of a visual interpretation of how, okay, how does the machine think through a recommendation almost? Yep. Uh, to show you the this other system that actually um, summarizes the content of a relatively small uh, document base here. Uh, news, uh, it's a news document base that contains general but also uh, quite specific concepts that here maybe yeah like commercially viable lithium ion mm -hmm. uh, battery and you can search these terms like i don't know that's for example see coalition government and uh, then you can see the occurrences of these you can see how it translates into another uh, language and you can see um, this within a document mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. documents in which it occurs with the translations of the key terms into the other target language that was selected. Oh, and so cool. uh, this uh, helps the interpreter or translator uh, get prepared uh, about how to translate. So you get the key terms and the domains in which you're working. Very cool, very cool. Wow, I, I love all the work that you're doing, Roberto. Congratulations, very, very cool. Thanks. Cool, so go check out Roberto and what he's got going on because it's it's amazing multilingual work um, using Knowledge Graph, NLP, and lots of other, other things. All right, and again, a big thank you to Roberto for joining me today. I am so excited to have him on the channel. He is somebody that I have followed for a very long time in my own research. So if you haven't checked out any of his, make sure you go and do that after this video. All right, so with that, I want to thank you very much, and I'll catch you next time.